Hello, welcome everyone to the 27th edition of the Information Plus Visualization Talk series at the University of Applied Sciences in Potsdam. Today we are very lucky and happy to welcome Mariah Meyer of Linköping University, who is going to talk about the kinds of research opportunities that emerge when designing uh, data visualizations. Mariah has just joined the Division of Media and Information Technology at Linköping University as a professor. She has a background in astronomy and astrophysics. And since her doctoral research turned her academic eye towards visualization research. Before joining the faculty at Linköping University in beautiful Sweden, Mariah was an associate professor in the School of Computing at the University of Utah and a member of the VIS Design Lab in the Scientific Computing and Imaging Institute. And today, she gratefully agreed to virtually visit us here in Potsdam and uh, talk a bit about what we learn through designing visualizations. We will now start with Mariah's talk, and then we'll have probably plenty of time for Q&A afterwards. Um, if you have already questions, feel free to use uh, the YouTube chat, which I think should be somewhere there, if I recall it correctly. Uh, so please make good use of that. Uh, and uh, now the screens are all yours, Mariah. I'm very happy that you're with us. Awesome, thanks so much. And thanks so much for the invitation and for everyone who's out there in the internet ethers that I can't see. Um, it's always super exciting to get to talk about research, especially in, in these days where we, we had very limited opportunities to, to do so. So thanks so much for the invitation, Marianne. So let me um, go ahead and share my screen. All right, I'm assuming you all are seeing this. So, um, okay, great. So, um, yeah, so I'm, today I'm gonna talk to you about, uh, about some of the things that we learn um, in my, as myself and in my research group um, through the, the practice of designing and creating uh, visualizations for people in the world. Um, I'm going to start by talking a little bit about the specific type of research methodology that we use and give you just a flavor for what, you know, our research process looks like and what I mean by designing um, visualizations. Um, and then I'll start digging into some of the things we've learned through giving you examples from um, some of the projects that um, I've gotten to work on. And then at the end, I'm going to really pivot and uh, talk about a lot of the new work that, that we've been doing um, in my group and, and the kinds of directions that I'm really excited to see this thread of uh, visualization research take. So, all right, here we're going to go. Okay, so um, so my my research is very much on the applied side of visualization in that uh, we are designing tools with and for people in the world. Um, so uh, the outcomes of many of the research projects that we do are actually um, bespoke tools. You see sort of an example of some of the ones that we've created here. Um, and they're tools that are really meant to help specific people who are working on specific types of analysis problems in the world. So as I briefly mentioned, we, we use a pretty specific research methodology that we call design study. Um, this is a method of inquiry in the visualization research community that's become pretty standardized. Um, about 10 years ago, myself and my colleagues, Michael Settlemayer and Tamara Munzner um, proposed this definition for a design study, um, which is that it is a project where you go and analyze some sort of real world problem. So working with real people on real data is a, is a necessary part of this process. Um, so you, you really go and analyze and understand like what, what their challenges are, how they're thinking about the data, what they want to do with it. Um, and then from there, you iteratively design a visualization system to support um, your collaborators in, in working with that data. We validate the designs that we create in the wild. So we both iteratively um, get feedback on prototypes, but also deploying tools back into the hands of the people that we're working with is really important. And this is a way for us to validate the kinds of tools and designs that we're developing. Um, and then this notion of reflection um, as a way for us to, um, to sort of uh, bubble up and come up with what our own insights and knowledge contributions are that we've learned along the way um, as, as visualization researchers is a really important part of this process as well. That's how we make contributions back to the research community. 
Now, since we proposed this definition um, 10 years ago, um, there's been dozens and dozens and dozens of published papers that have made use of um, design study. Um, so it's a very, uh, it's a growing and vibrant aspect of visualization research um, today. Uh, and there's also been a, a, quite a bit of theor theoretical work that's, um, that's come about to help um, to help structure both the, the process we go through in a design study, um, but also to inform the kinds of decisions that we make and how we might go about validating those decisions. And then also for us even to think about what does it mean to do rigorous and trustworthy um, research in this very design oriented, iterative, messy, complex type of inquiry method. So there's a lot of theoretical work now that also underpins the ways that we do design study in the community. Um, but the thing I really want to stress about design study that I think is sort of the thing that makes it a different type of inquiry method from other approaches to viz research is the sort of immersive, deeply collaborative nature of it. So does, at the heart of design study is really about working with people in the world who have data and trying to really deeply understand the ways that they think and to incorporate that kind of understanding into the designs that we um, that we're coming up with. So this notion of immersion is really important. And in fact, many of the students in my group go off and do field studies for three or six months at a time. And I'll talk about some of those projects um, as we go along in this talk. Um, but the thing I want to the thing I want to talk to you about today is sort of given that that context. Um, I'm I'm I, I'm really interested in this question of how do we how do we use design study um, in visualization research? Like what are the things that we learn about and what's the kind of knowledge that we as biz researchers can acquire from this methodology? And there's sort of two ways that, that this is really being used in our community. And the first one is using design study as a method. And by this, I mean, is that we are designing visualizations through the study of the world. So we immerse ourselves, we deeply understand our collaborators, and we that understanding is what allows us to then design new visualization techniques and systems. Um, but there's a second there's a second way to think about how we use design study, and that's the notion of research through design study, which is that we study the world through the process and the practice of designing visualizations. Um, and so in this talk, I'm going to give examples of both of these different approaches. And we'll start with, um, you know, what does it mean to use design study as a method? Okay, so here uh, I'll just start with a project. Um, it's an oldie but goodie. Um, this was a project I worked on um, a number of years ago with some biologists who study yeast and specifically they're studying metabolism in yeast and trying to understand how metabolism has changed um, uh, through, through evolution and different related species of yeast. And, and this understanding turns out to have implications for um, our own understanding of complex diseases like cancer. And so in this project, I got to work with a uh, really brilliant science communicator named Bang Wong. Um, and we were working with some folks at the Broad Institute in Boston. So when Bang and I first started working with this group of um, yeast biologists, uh, they were looking at their data using heat maps like this. And in fact, this is, this is actually a visualization that they were using. Um, and uh, here, what we're looking at is we're looking at a really a really common type of biological data called gene expression, which is basically tells you how much a gene is on or off in a cell. Um, and for them, they were they were uh, measuring gene expression at multiple time points in different experiments, and for many different species of yeast, and in many different um, and for many different uh, genes. And so they would or they would uh, they would uh, take this information and display it in a heat map like this. And so when we, when we first started talking with this group, they told us, yeah, we can see some high level trends and patterns, but they were really interested in very subtle different changes, particularly temporal changes over, um, temporal changes in the data set that they said were, was really difficult to discern in this visualization technique. And so um, Bang and I decided to step back and say, okay, how might we use some fundamental visualization principles to come up with a new visualization technique here? And so the one that we leaned into was this principle that spatial encoding is the most effective encoding channel we have for looking at quantitative data. And by spatial encoding, I mean positioning a mark on a common scale like you might do in a scatter plot, or encoding a value with the length of a mark such as in a bar chart. And so, <clears throat> 
excuse me. I just get so excited to talk about visualization. Okay, so, um, so this, this fundamental principle um, is, is something that um, it shows up in many of our visualization tech book, textbooks, and it comes from a variety of sources, some of which are empirical studies. Um, so the, the first study that that sort of showed this effect was um, one that was run in the 80s by two statisticians named Cleveland and McGill, where they did a controlled um, laboratory um, experiment, perceptual study, um, where they had participants um, answer questions about um, encoded values, looking at different kinds of ways to encode the data, such as position, color, angle, and so on. And that result showed that these spatial encodings were the easiest um, and most effective for people to accurately uh, read off data values. Uh, this experiment was replicated um, years later by uh, another group um, at the time at Stanford, um, Heron Bostock, where they ran this experiment on Mechanical Turk. So they were reaching thousands of participants and they got very similar effects. And so from empirical studies like this, combined with lots and lots of anecdotal um, evidence, we, we um, as a community have this guideline that a, you know, spatial encoding um, for quantitative values is a very precious resource. And so for Bang and I, we said, well, what might that mean for our data? How might we go from a heat map to something that um, encodes data spatially? Because our data was temporal, we decided to try line charts. And once we made that decision, it turns out there's still a million lower level design decisions to be made about how do you show a line chart? And so we went into Illustrator and mocked up, you know, a couple dozen different ways um, of showing these line charts and we printed them on a poster and when we looked at them, um, it was the one that I'm showing here all the way on the right, these filled framed line charts that to us, the nuanced shapes and the nuanced differences in the, in, in the different time series really popped out. And so we decided to use that and we created a new technique that we ended up calling a curve map where we um, where we uh, create this matrix of these filled frame line charts. In this case, it was ordered by species for the rows and different genes by the column. And we, uh, we, we um, um, uh, implemented this, this technique in a multi-view system for the biologists. And using this, um, they were actually able to uncover new things they had never seen about their data that led to follow-up experiments and new scientific discoveries. And so this is an example of how we were able to um, study the world in order to design new visualization techniques. And I, I'd argue that the most common kind of uh, contribution that comes out of design study is something like this, a new visualization technique or, or a novel visualization system. And I've done a lot of this in my own work. So uh, another example would be something that we call a connectivity matrix which is um, looking at patterns of paths within complex networks um, using an adjacency matrix style technique. Um, another one was in a collaboration with poets where we were looking at the sonic topology of a poem. And another example is, is one uh, where we were uh, uh, using this sort of radial layout in order to show um, in order to allow people to compare the similarities and differences between different genomes. So these new techniques are the sort of bread and butter of design study. Um, and it's, it's what most people will claim as their knowledge contribution. And I think that's great. And I think it's a really useful way to use design study. Um, but uh, I think the thing that the really underappreciated and to me very much more exciting way to use design study is really this idea of how we can study the world through designing visualizations. Um, and so I'm gonna give you a couple of examples here. Um, and the first example that I'm going to give is how we can actually study our own design processes through the practice of designing visualizations. And so here I'm gonna talk about another project. This was one working with some uh, neuroscientists um, and this project was headed up by a student of mine, Ethan Kersner. And these neuroscientists, they, they work in a really interesting um, part of biology where they're, um, they work in something called connectomics, 
which um, the, these neuroscientists and connectomists, what they wanna do is actually reconstruct the wiring diagram of the brain at the neuron level. And they do this <clears throat> with some really amazing technology where they take little cubes of brain material. And in, in the case of our collaborators, they were studying rabbit brains, little cube of frozen brain, and they put it through what's essentially a very high resolution uh, meat slicer, deli slicer, and they make these little slices. They take these little slices of brain and, and put them on a, on a very high resolution um, microscope that they then image and they get these images. And then they, they do this for each little slice of the, of the frozen brain. And then from there, they can segment the images and actually reconstruct the cells and how they're connected in this volume of, um, from this volume of images. So it's kind of amazing data, um, but the, they sort of, they, uh, they, from, from, from that volumetric information, they abstract this to basically a graph, a very dense, um, densely connected graph. So the, the, the challenge Ethan had when he started working with this group was they were really trying to understand the, this, the, the kinds of uh, frequency of different types of connectivities between different sorts of cells. And so when he, Ethan started working with this group, he'd go to one person in the lab and interview them and they'd say, here's the really interesting specific problem I wanna work on, or I think you should work on. And then he'd go to another person in the lab and they'd be like, no, 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 here's the really interesting problem to work on. And after several months of this, he was having a hard time really understanding what was a good opportunity for him as a Viz researcher to come in and design new tools. And it was about that time that we, um, in our research group, read a paper that had come out from the uh, from a group in London, where they um, they had conducted a design study with energy analysts. Um, and uh, what caught our eye was their use of participatory workshops in that process, and specifically early stage in the process of trying to uncover visualization opportunities. And in their paper, they, they report on just how, if, how effective these workshops were in getting consensus about what um, interesting, the interesting problems would be for the designers to tackle. Um, and they got this consensus in just a few short days. And so we were super compelled and Ethan, so Ethan went off, he designed and then ran a creativity workshop um, with our uh, neuroscience collaborators. And it was a huge success. Um, not only, you know, in a single day workshop was he able to uncover um, some really interesting visualization opportunities, but all kinds of like squishy stuff happened too that was really important for the collaboration such as getting, um, giving our collaborators agency in the process, having them um, also trust us more with uh, the directions we wanted to go. And to the point that there was um, senior people in the lab that we had a hard time getting meetings with that then agreed to bi-weekly meetings um, through the duration of the project. So a lot of really great stuff came out of this workshop. Ethan went on and created a tool with this group shown here called Graffinity that we deployed. And um, he, he deployed this a couple of years ago and it's still a tool that's in use by the group today. So that was a real success for us. So after this project, Ethan went and approached the first author from the London group um, to just chat about their mutual experiences of running these specific kinds of, of visualization workshops. Um, that initial conversation led to a two and a half year long discussion between um, us at Utah and this group um, in London, um, where we collectively reflected on our experience of 17 workshops in 10 projects and on three continents. And the result of this was a, um, was a, a framework, a theoretical framework for conducting these kinds of visualization participatory workshops, um, both the things you do to plan the workshop, um, important considerations for running, and then also analyzing the workshop outcomes at the end. And so this, for me, this is an example of how we were able to use um, uh, reflection across the design study, or in this case, across multiple projects in order to come up with new methods um, for us as visualization um, designers and researchers. Um, so so how, 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 we, how we can engage with the world in more effective ways. Um, but this idea of using um, design study to study the world um, takes a slightly different turn in this project that I'm gonna tell you about, 
which is one that um, we were working with global health experts um, and specifically people that were studying or experts that were studying the spread of the Zika virus in Latin America about five years ago when that was going on. Um, and and th this, was, this was a real public health concern because um, in particular because of the effects on babies that were infected in utero um, with these side effects of things like microcephaly. So this was a project that was headed up by another student of mine, Nina McCurdy. And um, we were working with, uh, health, with public health experts that were working at the US Agency of International Development in Washington, DC. Um, and this project had all the makings of a really straightforward design study. Um, our collaborators had data, they had already tried to visualize it and were really struggling. Um, and they were really excited to give us time and space to think about some innovative ways to, to, to visualize their data. So Nina went to Washington DC and spent six months embedded with this group. And over the course of that time, she did some iterative design work and ultimately ended up with a prototype that looked um, like this, where she um, used uh, sort of best practices for looking at uh, 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 temporal and geographic information. And so she designed this tool to really look at both um, information about the spread of the Zika virus, coupled with information about different um, resources that the international community was sending to the region to help combat the spread of the disease. Now, at the end of her field study, um, she uh, she got feedback from multiple different types of stakeholders on this tool, and all the feedback was overwhelmingly positive. Um, you know, people said that this was a really, really nice tool for looking at the data that they had. But um, when we tried to actually get our immediate primary collaborators to use the tool in their day-to-day -day work, they were really hesitant. And this really surprised us. But Nina spent some time and really dug into this hesitancy. And what, what she uncovered was even though the tool is a good representation of their data, the data was not a good representation of what these experts knew to be true about the spread of the virus on the ground. And so uh, we shifted to really think about this because it, it struck us as interesting. And um, what we came to learn is that this, these discrepancies in the day, or I should say, one, you know, one of the first um, clues of these, the, of this notion of the discrepancies of the data from sort of the truth the experts knew showed up when we showed one of our collaborators a choropleth like this one. And she remarked to us, like, you know, here what you're seeing is Brazil's in dark red, indicating a relatively high percentage of cases in the population, whereas Colombia is in a much lighter orange, indicating a lower percentage. And our collaborator remarked, yes, but Brazil reports all cases where Colombia only reports after a full investigation. And the implication here was that the data, the, the, the different ways that these countries were reporting Zika cases was resulting in a, um, in a possibly misleading um, picture of what was actually happening um, uh, in, these in these countries. Um, I say, I, you know, this, this work happened a number of years ago, and I think about this all the time. I've thought about this a lot over the last two years in the ways that I've consumed information about COVID. It's, it's completely the same. Um, but in the case of, of this that we were studying, these discrepancies were showing up because of, a, of the data generation pipeline, the ways that the data was, um, uh, the ways that in this case, uh, Zika cases were detected, recorded, collected, and so on. And it was really the distributed and, and heterogeneous nature of this that was the problem because this pipeline was implemented differently in every country. Um, and uh, that, that pipeline um, was shaped by the country's political, cultural, economic, geographic, and demographic context. And it resulted in discrepancies like the union in Region X goes on strike often and doesn't report Zika data, or Country Y overhauled its surveillance system, leading to a sudden increase in detected cases. <clears throat> and so we were really interested in this and um, ended up formalizing um, this discrepancy into something that we called implicit error, which is measurement error that is inherent to a given data set, assumed to be present and prevalent, but not explicitly defined or accounted for. And so what we, uh, what we did is we came up with a characterizing description of implicit error in the context of the Zika data, and also thought about how visualizations play a role in helping to externalize 
um, these implicit errors as well as, as, as be able to communicate it back to others. So Nina developed an annotation mechanism um, to go along with the tool to help um, her collaborators be able to externalize what they knew about the data and the ways in which it was um, it had discrepancies, and then also how to uh, start communicating that back um, um, among colleagues. Okay, so implicit error, I think, is super interesting. I'm going to come back to it in like two minutes um, because it's something we've thought about a lot ever since because I think that even though you know we were talking about this in the case of Zika data, this happens in just about every domain that I've worked in from public health through biology. Um, and so you know I think this is a really interesting concept to think about. So, so these, these, these last two examples, um, the, the workshops as well as the implicit error are really examples of how we use design study as a method of inquiry to learn something about the world, something about the relationship of people and data and how we can design for that. Um, and and this, this is the aspect of, of visualization design study that I'm really, really interested in and where all my recent work has gone. Um, and so going forward, there's sort of two threads under this umbrella that I'm really interested um, or I've been interested in thinking about. And the first one is around this notion of the production of knowledge. So if we think about design study as a method of, an inquir of inquiry, a way to study the world, how do we think about what we come to learn through that? And this ends up being a really complex question because of the um, uh, sort of normative traditional ways, at least within the, the computer science and visualization community, we think about knowledge and all the ways in which design study makes it really hard to validate what we've learned. And so, um, so that's, that's sort of one thing I've been thinking a lot about. Um, and the other one is, is how we can, um, how can we use this method of inquiry in order to think about how we might have more inclusive, sustainable, and ethical visualization design um, going forward. So I'm gonna give some very quick examples in both of these sorts of threads, um, just to give you a flavor of the ways in which we're thinking about these things. Okay, so under this production of knowledge. So we've been, we've been doing a lot of reading recently in um, feminist theory. And so I know this overlaps a lot with Marian's research, but maybe other people on this call or on the Zoom chat as well. Um, but really what we've been intrigued by is this idea of thinking about knowledge as this very entangled emergent thing that happens through, um, in, yeah, through interactions with many different things, you know, people, technology, history, power, culture, um, and, and how, we might, how we might start to think about what does knowledge and insight and contribution mean when you, when you think about it all as this you know, sort of entangled mess of, of interactions. Um, and so we've been looking a lot at feminist theory as a way to help theorize around what does, what does um, visualization insight and the insights people get from visualization look like from these lenses. And, and, and specifically, one thing I think is really interesting is how are we as biz designers then implicated and entangled with the kinds of things people come to learn through using our tools. Um, one way that this has played out is in some, some recent um, work that we've been thinking about called data hunches, which is really a reframing of, of implicit error that I was just talking about with Zika data and thinking about discrepancies in data to instead you know, apply a more critical feminist lens to that and to think about you know, what are the hunches people bring to the analysis that they do. Um, we argue that in many, most, all visual analysis um, of data that people know something about, you know, you bring a lot of intuitions about, you know, how to read that data, like what, you know, what, what ways is the data an imperfect representation of the reality you care about. Um, and from this like feminist lens, it gives us an opportunity to think about those hunches as first class citizens along with data. And that these are all different perspectives on the thing we care about, which is the thing in the world we're trying to understand. And so in this work, we, we talk about hunches from this perspective, and then we talk about a design space for how we might externalize um, uh, hunches in a visual space, and then also communicate those back to others. Um, a, another example was a, a really fun project that we had um, just this last year. Um, we, it was at the Alt Biz Conference, for those of you that were at IEEE Biz 
where um, we uh, became increasingly, we wrote about how we became increasingly uncomfortable with the community's use of the word chart junk. Um, you know, maybe none of you have heard of chart junk and I would be so grateful, um, but it, it's a term that comes from Edward Tufte, who is an oversized figure in the community. Um, but as we start to sort of, you know, it, the, the, as, a, as a research community, we've sort of adopted principles and terminology from places and sources that are um, that are themselves loaded with baggage and opinions and bias that we as the community may not value and chart junk is one of them. Um, and so we sort of dug into the writings of Edward Tufte and looked at how this, you know, where this term came about from. It was really in, in what I would consider a political manifesto meant to elevate statistical approaches design over designerly approaches um, and uh, the sort of implications of our community for continuing to propagate those kinds of ideas. And so here we had a manifesto where we were saying, let's not use chart junk, let's use more precise terms. Um, and then uh, the Daria, the first author on this, she also um, did some performative maintenance art in actually getting rid of chart junk that you can find at our website, chartjunk.art. Um, it was a really sort of fun project to work on. Um, and then the sort of last example in this sort of space I want to give is some, some more work that we've been doing and really thinking about how do we make our design process transparent and open to others. And so we've been experimenting with what it means to collect an abundant um, collection of artifacts from our design studies. And here is an example of a um, interface where uh, that, that um, one of one of my students worked on um, to supplement a paper that was meant to give people access to all of the design artifacts that she collected over a three month field study. And so from here, we've been thinking about how these artifacts might help to paint a picture or tell a story about an emergence of the insights that we come to and how we can use that to expose that to others. Um, and so for example, um, we start um, tagging different artifacts with say the different kinds of techniques we use to um, create the artifacts or the different kinds of domain specific um, concepts that are associated with it. In this case, this notion of convergence that was a biological concept from our collaborators. And by doing this, it allowed us to start tracing, um, tracing the evolution of, of um, different sorts of um, insights we were coming to um, over the collection of artifacts. And so we're, we've been playing around with formalizing this into something that we call trace, um, which is um, how we might make visible the emergence of insights over this collection of abundant artifacts. And this is work that another student of mine, Jen Rogers, has been leading. And the three R's are meant to represent um, what trace supports um, in design study, which is recording. How do we record evidence? How do we reflect on that evidence for the research process? And then ultimately, how do we report in transparent ways? And so, so this is another um, sort of thinking about the production of knowledge that um, uh, another piece of work we're pursuing in the space. And so in this line, some of the future questions I'm interested in around production of knowledge in design study is how do we produce and report new visualization knowledge? So first, how does it come to be? And then how do we share that with others? Um, and then this question of, you know, what are the ways that we that we as the designer of tools and technology, how are we implicated in how others gain insight when they actually use and interact with the technology that we produce? Um, and so the second question starts to get into um, this next sort of umbrella thing I'm interested in, in thinking about design study as inquiry, which is how then we can think about um, doing this sort of work in a more inclusive, sustainable, and ethical way. Um, so I first briefly mentioned another um, sort of ongoing project that we call the Ethics of Exit. <clears throat> and this is a project that's headed up by another student of mine, Daria Baba. And now really at the high level, we're interested in this question of like, how do we ethically exit a collaboration? So in these design studies, one of the, they, they, they tend to take a long time. Typical design study in my group takes two years. Um, it requires a lot of time from our collaborators and a lot of time and resources on our side. And there's this very uncomfortable question that often comes up is when do you stop? Do you stop when you publish your viz paper? Do you stop when your, your collaborator publishes a paper? Do you stop when the technology doesn't work anymore? 
there's this question is is really um, challenging as a design study researcher and one that the community hasn't really at least publicly grappled with yet. And so we're really digging into this and, and thinking about questions like, are our tours are are our tools sustainable and should they be like who's going to maintain them after we're gone? Um, do we have responsible labor practices? Who's actually producing these tools and what is what is their own um, role in that and their own responsibility? Um, what do we as viz researchers contribute beyond tools? You know, is is a design study just about giving a tool to someone, or are there other things? Um, that are mutually beneficial um, in this process. And ultimately, are, are we as design studies researchers leaving the world a better place? Um, and so um, there was a recent, uh, uh, there's some, some, some recent interesting things going on that I saw on Twitter recently that are sort of in the space that sort of exemplify some of the things that we're thinking about. Um, there's a paper that was just out um, not long ago from um, Johanna Drucker, where she was grappling with some of this notion of sustainability um, when it comes to the realities of technology and how fast it changes and what does that mean for digital humanists. Um, but the ways that she referred to, uh, the ways that she in some ways dismissed the deep challenges of maintaining software in today's age, um, irked some people. And so there were some interesting Twitter threads that came out um, sort of pointing out that uh, the, the, the sort of oversight um, that was implied by some of the statements made in this paper and dismissing just how hard maintenance is of technology. So I think there's these questions around, you know, what does what is maintenance? What should we be maintain, maintaining? Um, how do we do that? How do we do that ethically? I very I don't know how to do this, but um, it's something we're thinking about. And um, uh, we're talking to a lot of people right now to try to figure it out. Okay, not figure it out, try to provide some guidance for how we can, how we can balance um, these competing constraints. Um, and so then the last project I wanna talk about um, is also some recent work um, that is also thinking about the notion of sustainability and what does that mean for the things that we're designing. Um, and this comes from a, a project, a multi-year project that we had in indoor air quality. So, and this, uh, this project headed up by another student of mine, Jimmy Moore. And so let me step back for a second, indoor air quality. Um, it turns out that the air quality in your homes is often much, much worse than the air quality outside your home. Um, this is invisible, but you know, so many things we do contribute to poor air quality in the home. Things like candles. Um, here I am in Sweden and it's like candle season. And every time I see candles, I'm like, oh, the air quality. Every time we cook, um, it produces huge amounts of particulate matter. Every time you vacuum, which is something you should do to um, <clears throat> improve your environment also causes poor air quality. For most of us, this goes unnoticed, but for people who are, uh, who uh, have respiratory diseases or things like asthma, Indoor air quality is a really big deal. And it's something that um, until we've recently had access to low cost sensors, it's been really hard to understand how is my indoor air quality. And so in this project, we were working with um, six families who, had, um, who were asthmatic. So either the parents were asthmatic and or they had asthmatic kids. Um, and this was a project that um, we worked on in Salt Lake City in Utah. And so with these families, um, they were really, they signed up to um, a larger parent study um, to, uh, to um, help people understand long-term health impacts, particularly on children around air quality. And they were willing to let us come in and deploy air quality sensors in their home, which is what we did. And so we developed a, um, a system that networked together three air quality sensors that we placed around the home, along with a real-time tablet to look at particulate matter counts on a 30 second um, uh, resolution. And also we developed a variety of ways for people to be able to annotate their data streams, including using uh, Google Home Assistant. Um, and so um, we had to modify these sensors to get them to network together, but ultimately we deployed this in our six homes. And these um, families lived with these um, air quality monitors for about a year, um, along with these tablets so they could get access to, to what was going on in their home. And they learned all kinds of really interesting things. And so this project ended up being a multi-year project for us. And um, it started um, with these field deployments that I was just talking about. 
Um, and here uh, we learned a lot. We did um, multiple uh, interviews across these deployments. And um, we, we learned a lot of things about uh, the benefits of deploying these systems, the ways in which people could use um, their personal data about their environments to do things like self-experiments and so on. Um, but ultimately our goal from, the, from this deployment was really to learn enough about what people wanted to do with their data in order to design a more sophisticated visual analysis system for them to really be able to answer um, um, their questions like, um, uh, should I open my windows? Uh, do I need to get a new um, um, furnace? Uh, these, these sorts of questions, which they couldn't answer from just a real-time display. So, but the problem was, is when we actually attempted to redesign um, our interface, we realized that from the, the feedback we collected during the deployments was really just on how people used the, the existing interface and how it might be improved, but didn't really get at how would they actually go about operationalizing these questions they had into sort of more sophisticated analysis that they could be doing on their data? Um, and we really struggled and struggled. And ultimately we, we found ourselves in this challenge of, we needed a way to observe them analyzing their data so that we could come up with design requirements, but we needed design requirements to design the tool in order to observe them doing it. And so we struggled with this for a while and ultimately we, we ended up designing a new method that we called the data engagement interview where we brought a analyst onto the interview team um, in order to provide real time um, visual analysis capabilities during an interview. And so we went back to our participants, we took a year's worth of their data and we sat with them um, along with this analyst and um, prompted them through, you know, through engagement questions about what are they interested in, in learning about how might they, you know, what might they want to do to their data or what might they want to see in their data in order to answer that question. And then the analyst would quickly, um, would quickly do that analysis on their data and present results. And these interviews were just amazing. Um, first of all, in exposing that people, people engage their data in ways that we were totally not expecting. Um, and they had a lot of fun doing it. And so as we were analyzing the, the results of these interviews, really interesting things popped up. And the first is that people were really playful. We had got, you know, as visual visualization researchers, we had assumed that people were going to be very goal oriented. I mean, after all, these were parents with asthmatic children who wanted to understand their home environment. So of course they were going to be goal oriented and how they approach their data. But it turns out that in every interview, they ended up just having a lot of fun and, um, and, and being very curious about what they saw. And most of the, the, the sort of things they learned about, they learned by just stumbling into discoveries. They would sort of see something in the data and be like, well, that's interesting. What is that about? What's going on? Um, or, and, and so it was this sort of more, more um, serendipitous approach to um, engaging with data that really surprised us. But despite these interviews being fun and being productive, when we explicitly asked them at the end, would you be willing, if you had a tool that did all this stuff for you, would you be willing to use it? They were all still reluctant to say yes for a variety of reasons that you can read about in our paper. Um, but this got us thinking like, you know, what are the kinds of things that we should be designing as visualization designers? Like if we can't motivate families with asthmatic children living in a city that has very poor air quality to look at their data, then what hope do we have in, in, you know, in, in really motivating anyone with their personal data? But the, the sort of success of these, these data engagement interviews also showed us that perhaps there's an opportunity here for us as visualization designers and researchers to think about not just designing tools, but designing more collaborative social systems. How might we scale these interviews into something like data clinics? What might that look like? How might that give more people more access to their data without the um, very resource heavy um, costs of designing bespoke tools for different groups of people? And so that's one of the, the, that's another big theme of questions I'm interested in pursuing, which is, you know, what might these um, social systems be um, for, for visual analysis capabilities in the world? Um, how do we think beyond just designing tools? Um, and then also, you know, what are our ethical obligations to our collaborators and to our participants as visualization designers? And how do we just start to unpack the complexities around what we do and the impact we have on the world when we're putting technology out there? So, okay, so 
in summary, um, uh, hopefully I've been able to um, engage you into thinking about design study as a really interesting approach and opportunity for us to study the world. Um, they are beautifully messy, complex, entangled. Um, they're, they're wonderful and full of rich opportunities for us to learn from. But because they are all these wonderful things, they also don't fit in with our um, existing normative theoretical foundations that we have in computer science and in visualization. And so there's a lot of interesting work to be done in rethinking how, you know, how do we, you know, what are our epistemologies, what are our ways of thinking about knowledge and how it is produced in the world? Um, and, and how do we how do we do um, good visualization design work from these new lenses? So my pitch, if any of this sounds really interesting, I am building a research group, as Marian said. I just started here at Linshoping a few months ago. I have open PhD and postdoc positions. Please reach out to me if this stuff sounds compelling. Um, and with that, um, thanks so much for tuning in. Um, I'm happy to take any questions that people might have. Awesome, Mariah, thank you so much. I think uh, what we're missing now is um, the ability of the crowd to clap. I'm just doing this as a, as a token audience oh, member. It's, it's deafening. I can hear it all the way over here. <laughs> this was amazing. Thank you so much, Mariah. We have already uh, one first question. I have a few questions myself, but I will keep them back if there are other questions and they're coming in. So um, I will start with Leonie's question. How many workshops with the same group would you recommend? And how much knowledge should the group have in terms of design slash visualization? Or is it enough for the group to be experts of their own needs? Um, that's a great question. Um, as for the number of workshops, the, the workshops that we've, we've been doing, it, it's, only, it's only one. And they're very much targeted to these early stage design requirements which um, does get to this question of, well, when in the process do you do them? And, and you know, we, we've sort of experimented a little bit with this, but it's this sort of fuzzy area of, you have, of, of knowing enough about your collaborators to know how to focus their efforts um, on, on, um, uh, on, 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 what's the sort of space of possibility? So you're not just talking about the, the whole, like anything that you could possibly do in say social science or biology. Um, also an important thing is to know enough about your collaborators to know who good participants would be and who, you know, who, who, who are the, the, the voices you need at the table. Um, so, so for example, um, one of my students is at Duke University right now. She's doing a three month field study with sociologists there. She ran a creativity workshop I guess about halfway through at about six or seven weeks, she ran one after spending six weeks there. Um, and that was a pretty good time. Um, so yeah, it takes, it takes some, some time in order before you can't just run them in the beginning, but also um, you don't want to run them too late and waste all your time doing lots of interviews. All right. Thank you. I will uh, go to the next question. Um, Tobias is writing here in the chat. Thank you for the great talk. A lot of the work showcased is very hands-on and immersive. What are some necessary yet hidden efforts that go into convincing and collaborating with external partners? Oh, goodness. That is such a, it's a, it's a great question. And it's one that I kind of dread getting because I don't have a good answer. Um, I mean, yeah, up front, these, these design studies, they take a lot of commitment on the part of our collaborators, which is why it's so important that we finally start thinking about like, mm -hmm. is it worth it? Um, but, you know, I, the, the projects that I've had that have been sort of successful collaborations with with domain experts, um, it they're often people that you you've spent a couple of months already sort of establishing a relationship with, a couple of conversations, and trying trying to understand like is there a good opportunity both from the vis side and from their side, and I've found that people tend to be the people that end up being interested in, in working um, with me and my group they're quite open to letting us come in and immerse. And I, I think maybe I've just, see, this is where I fumble with this question. It's such a good question and it's so hard. 
And at the end of the day, I've just been very lucky and grateful that I've had lots of people come to me with problems and gotten to pick and choose based upon the ones that seem committed to letting us come in and work with them. Gosh, that's a terrible think, answer. No, I, I think it's fair. I think there's a mutual, uh, uh, I think, interest in the collaboration. And they have been lucky to work with you too. I mean, that's, I think uh, there's, a, there's a knowledge exchange, right? And yeah. maybe, uh, I mean, there might be more questions coming in. I, I will leave a bit of time for folks uh, on, the, on the stream. Uh, but one question I was ha I had uh, kind of goes a bit into that direction because I do I love the idea of uh, thinking of formats of um, encounter with uh, different expertises, especially in, in, in like if we think of the uh, creativity workshops, but also the uh, data engagement interviews. In a way, it's a it's a method for bringing folks of different backgrounds and expertises together to talk and do data and this. So I, I wanted to just hear a bit um, where you see that. Is it just, um, of course, everything we do involves, uh, uh, you know, getting around the table or whatever, but it seems to be to become more crucial actually that, that uh, like basically managing and in a way planning and designing the conditions for these encounters. Uh, I don't know if you can that's, elaborate. It's so interesting that you put those two things together. I hadn't thought about them like that, but that's such a nice way to think about it. Absolutely. Yeah, it's, it, you're right. It's different ways of bringing various people in, that are in, in, involved in this thing together. Um, yeah. And it is absolutely the thing that we spend more and more time. Or I spend more and more time in my research thinking about, you know, and um I mean, we have papers just on the workshop. We have papers just on this in interview process, which I think is, for me, one of the things that's interesting is that, you know, I came up in this sort of viz tradition of like, it's the tool and the technique, but sort of being open to all this other interesting stuff that can come out and that we can contribute back um, has been a very um, um, welcome uh, change because I, now I go into design studies being like, eh, even if there's no like fancy new visualization, there's something else we're going to learn about. Don't worry. There's something else that will come up. Um, so in some ways it's relieved some pressure, but I do, th I think that that, I just find that whole like encounter, it's such a nice word. The encounters we have is so deeply interesting and su such um, opportunities to do things differently. And for us to, um, you know, this notion of participatory work is something that, you know, gosh, here I am in Scandinavia, right? It's like the birthplace of this. Um, <laughs> people have been thinking about this for so long. And, and you know, we see this in the biz community too. Like, you know, there's, there's a lot more work in this space happening. Um, and, but I, I do think that there's unique aspects that, of what we need to do for visualization. That means we can't just wholesale take from other communities that have thought about say participatory methods mm -hmm. or other ways of encountering you know, in, for example, in our workshops and in these interview methods, it's specific things about engaging with data through visualization that makes for interesting research projects for us because we can try these things other, other people put out and then say, well, what do we need to do to adapt them? What's unique about visual, the visualization space? So um, yeah, I think it's a good opportunity. <laughs> It's interesting that you just mentioned also the VIS community because that's actually what the next question is about by Mark Jan, who asks, do you think reviewers need to change their expectations regarding contributions of design studies or do authors need to become better in setting the diversifying visualization knowledge they produce? Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, it's a great question. I think it's absolutely both. Um, yeah. I, you know, as, as someone who's had papers that I think are brilliant, reject and been like reviewers. That happened know. to you too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but also someone who's like reviewed papers and been like, you're sitting on a wealth of knowledge. Tell me about it. Um, I think it goes both ways. And, and I think, you know, there's some interesting conversations going on in the community too, around the, uh, the, the sort of challenge of what we're asking people, particularly in applied and design oriented biz mm -hmm. side to do like now, not only do people, both reviewers and like, you know, researchers, you have to be like, you have to be this knowledgeable, you have to be methods knowledgeable, you have to be methodology knowledgeable, you have to be a good writer. There's like so many things now that we're asking people to do well, that 
it makes it very easy to poke holes in work. And it also makes it very challenging to do all of it really well because we, we can't be, you know, it's the rare person who's a trained designer and software engineer and qualitative researcher. Like, who is that? That's like none of us. So um, I think, I think you know, for myself, like having, you know, struggling with learning all those things and how to do them well has also led me to perhaps try to have more grace when I'm reviewing and trying to recognize that this is difficult for all of us. So um, I think it's just a continual process. We need more good examples. You know, like I'm always looking for like the great papers that I can like use as templates and be like, all right, here's a great paper. What did they do? Like, how can we sort of follow, you know, good practices here too? So I think finding those handful of good papers has also been really helpful for me for, you know, being able to, you know, whatever, what is it? Uh, uh, copying is the greatest form of flattery. <laughs> Yes, we, and need, think, we need good examples. And I think especially since uh, the design, the DSM paper, as it has become known, uh, I think has opened uh, uh, the door for uh, this other kind of research. Uh, I mean, that has been around, but also giving it a name and giving it uh, maybe not a template, but at least uh, a bit of a structure that one could follow or respond to in a way. Um, I have one more question, and I don't know if anyone else is warming up. You don't see the, the typing uh, three dots, uh, I don't know if <laughs> anyone else, but uh, maybe it's the last one, we'll see. Um, so you mentioned the, uh, the different kind of data discrep discrepancies, discrepancies uh, in the Zika virus case study um, and, the kind of in, and in your implicit error research. And my sense is that, um, um, that lately this research is moving back uh, uh, in, in the data this pipeline. It's, there's much more interest in the, in the conditions, in the circumstances of data generation, data collection. So I'm, I wanted to maybe ask you to speculate a bit if you want, uh, <laughs> whether you see whether and how or where you see kind of the, the kind of potential for I don't know, maybe it could be called interrogative data vis that actually exposes that parts or um, something that actually, I mean, I guess if you explicate the implicit error, it's not implicit anymore, but how, in a way you need, you need someone actually um, knowing that there is something like an implicit error, right? Uh, like for, from the surface, we wouldn't have known that Colombia and Brazil reported the virus cases uh, uh, differently. So like what's, what's the role of visualizations as artifacts or visualization research in that in these earlier bits of the data um, processing visualization pipeline? Yeah, I, 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 I love this question. And, you know, Marion, I'll point to a lot of the work that you've done in, in the space of like applying sort of, you know, critical thinking to visualizations and pointing out that there, there's all these challenges with, with data in general that, you know, at least in the Viz community, suddenly this year, at the, the Viz conference, people were talking about all over the place, like data is not neutral and data is designed and data is, you know, it's a product. <laughs> like, what do we do about that? And this is where I think like, you know, sort of being able to take those critiques and actually, I think visualization is this really interesting place for us to um, be able to communicate that or like, you know, or push people to view data as non-neutral and as only like, you know, a partial perspective on something. Um, and so I think there's a lot of opportunities for visualization to bring personal knowledge in. That was our whole data hunches idea and sort of elevating that with data. Um, I think that there's, you know, opportunities. I know, you know, you've written about, you know, hidden labor, like how do, how do we annotate, you know, within a visualization system, annotate data to allow people to, um, to have those kinds of acknowledgements, like even just within a tool that, that sort of stays with the, like there's all kinds of, I think, interesting opportunities that, I think particularly visualization, like if you think about sort of data science or whatever more broadly, I think the Viz is where it's really an interesting place to think about how we can acknowledge the challenges or the problems with data and then actually think about how do we expose that, you know, sort of more visibly to the world. Um, so I, I, it's what excites me <laughs> right now. Um, and so I, I think you're right, like, um, um, yeah, sort of showing the human touch on, on data all the way from the point it's measured through the point that we sort of communicate it and showing that sort of like, if not with visualization, then what else? 
I think that was a closing statement, unless I actually just saw there was actually a small follow-up question from Tobias, uh, but it really links nicely with what you just said, Mariah, uh, which is, um, could you elaborate on the data engagement interviews? Uh, this seems like a great way to turn the data this pipeline into a feedback loop. So it, I think it is that, in a way, that potential for the human touch of the, um, yeah, the data processing necessary before it's visualized or while it's visualized, I don't know. Can you say a few more words about that format or that method? Yeah, I mean, you know, we really went into designing that method because we didn't know how to design the tool. But then, you know, we 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 discovered that the or we speculate the method is actually like really useful for a whole lot of different things besides just getting design requirements. And I think that that's I hadn't considered this idea of using them to sort of. Um, as a way to, to sort of acquire sort of more and diverse perspectives on the thing data is meant to capture. But that's absolutely something that would be really, really interesting to think about how we could, um, instead of just designing tools to help people externalize stuff, how do we design this like collaborative space um, to capture that kind of information? Um, kind of related to that, one of the things that was really uh, interesting in our interview analysis was that, you know, we, we were working with per personal data. It was data about people's homes and personal data is notoriously opaque unless it's annotated. In this case, we had a year's worth of, you know, 30 second interval particulate measure counts without people labeling like, oh, I just, you know, seared some meat on the stove or I cooked bacon or I just lit some candles. The data would be like completely unintelligible. Our participants in these interviews, almost all of them at some point remarked like, gosh, I wish I had annotated more. Like some of them were good annotators, some of them were not. Mm -hmm. And all of them at some point came up in the interview against things they wanted to understand, but without the annotations, that context was lost. And so one of the things we speculated about for these interviews is it was really, it, would have been, it could be useful to run these sort of earlier in some sort of self-tracking um, study because it, could, it can show people like, the, the potential of their data, if they're, you know, it shows them why it might be worth it for them to put an effort. And so I think that, that that kind of thing probably could apply more broadly to just showing people the value of data um, or not also the things it's not gonna be able to tell you early mm -hmm. on. Well, I know that uh, Tobias, who just asked that question, will really appreciate that answer as well uh, with that pitch for annotation for later use. Um, thank you, Mariah. This was so much fun. It was so insightful and interesting for me and I'm sure also for all the others who have watched and who will watch this because thankfully it is recorded. Uh, Technology makes Forever. it possible. <laughs> sure. <laughs> well, thanks so much. so much for the invitation and for everyone who sort of engaged with this talk. Great, thank you. I will pull the plug now. I think it should be here. And thanks everyone also. Yeah, as you said, Mariah, thanks everyone for popping by and sharing your questions and uh, yeah, listening and watching. <laughs>